Good afternoon on today's Angry Bulletin. In our latest update on the NASA CLPS mission, it appears that Intuitive Machines is doing a fantastic job of getting their probe to the moon in excellent condition. Everything thus far has been going very well with this probe, a couple of minor hiccups, but for the most part, things could not be going better. The probe managed to take some very spectacular images of our Earth as it left the planet behind, and it also set a very crucial milestone which few people expected this company to set. And meanwhile, back here on Earth, Japan and JAXA, together with Mitsubishi Heavy Industries, have bounced back in a huge way, successfully launching their latest rocket into orbit. Why is this a big deal? All of this and more coming at you on The Angry Astronaut right now. Good afternoon, and once again, welcome to The Angry Astronaut. I'm sure most of you have tuned into this because you are very interested in the Intuitive Machines mission, the United States' second attempt to perform a soft landing on the surface of the moon in the 21st century. It's actually been a very long time since any American company, organization, whatever, has been able to set down on the moon. The last time, of course, happening with the final Apollo mission in the early 1970s. Some people were beginning to wonder whether or not the United States had lost its touch along with the Russians, who also attempted to land on the moon recently and failed, although admittedly they got a bit further than Astrobotic did. Boy, I'll tell you, they ran into the worst possible luck with the failure of that one valve sabotaging their entire propulsion system. Let's hope that they are much more successful on their second attempt, especially given the importance of the cargo that they have on board. But this episode is going to be focusing a lot more more, obviously, on Intuitive Machines and what they've been accomplishing. And they have carried out some unique milestones on their way to the moon where they are going to be attempting their landing on the 22nd of February. By the way, at that time, I am going to be in Washington, D.C. Thanks to you guys, thanks to my supporters, I'm going to be able to attend an FAA commercial space conference where I'm going to have an opportunity to meet a whole lot of power brokers in the commercial space industry and bring a lot of fantastic content your way. But before I get to any of that, we need to talk about what happened in Japan. Last year, with the failure of the maiden launch of the H-3 rocket, and especially with the loss of a very valuable cargo that was in the fairing of that rocket, JAXA, Mitsubishi Heavy Industries, Japan in general, looked to be in a terrible state of affairs. Looked that they had fallen behind not only China, but also India, practically Every other spacefaring nation looked like that they were going to be accomplishing much greater things than Japan ever could, which is not what anybody thought was going to happen 20, 30 years ago when Japan was moving into the space industry with a great deal of ambition. And it seems that Japan now has fallen significantly behind in their economy, of course, also struggling at this time. So a lot of people were really questioning whether or not Japan was a failed player in this whole game. But now they've proven otherwise with a successful soft landing on the moon. A mission which, in spite of the fact it didn't go totally smoothly, it managed to gather a lot more data than anybody was anticipating. Really, an unqualified success on the surface of the moon, and of course, Japan being only the fifth nation in history to successfully land on the moon. So, very impressive. And now the H-3 rocket has carried out a successful second flight with no flaws whatsoever. It was able to deploy its payload. And this has changed things dramatically in terms of how competitive Japan is going to be in the world of commercial space flight. But why? I mean, what makes the H-3 rocket special? It's an expendable rocket with solid rocket boosters. What's so exciting about that? Well, we're going to find out right now. Uh, go Main engine start. Main engine start. SRB3 take lift off. So it's boost up ignition and lift off. H3 rocket 
賞試験期2号機は2024年2月17日午前9時22分55秒に種子島宇宙センターから打ち上げられました。It has taken over 10 years for the H 3 rocket to finally enter service, but it did with a splash. And let me explain why. First of all, this medium lift rocket from JAXA is the first rocket from Japan, the first heavier lift rocket anyway, that is a 100% Japanese creation. The rocket construction is Japanese, the engines, both on the first stage, the LE 9 engines, The LE 5B3 engines on the second stage, and also the solid rocket boosters, the SRB3s, all of those are Japanese as well, as opposed to some of the older technology, which had a lot of orbital ATK in them. This is a 100% Japanese created rocket, and because it is manufactured in Japan, pretty much 100% by Mitsubishi Heavy Industries, you can reduce the cost because you're Not having to bring in any outside contractors. As long as Mitsubishi Heavy Industries is 100% committed to delivering reduced cost, they can theoretically compete with SpaceX, and they have succeeded in doing so with this particular rocket. We're talking $50 million per launch, which is substantially less even than the Falcon 9. And there's a number of different configurations. You have the H33. 30S, which is just the rocket, no solid rocket boosters, and three engines on the primary stage. The H322S, which is two engines on the primary stage, two solid rocket boosters, and a short fairing. The H332L, it's actually a modification from what you're seeing right there three engines on the primary stage, and two solid rocket boosters, plus a bigger fairing. And then finally, the most powerful version, the H324L, which has two engines on the primary stage and four solid rocket boosters with an extended fairing. So, what does this all mean in terms of performance? Well, actually, Japan doesn't provide all the information on that. The press kit lists a capability of 6.5 tons or even more to geostationary transfer orbits. Anytime you're translating Asian languages over to English, you can run into some difficulties there. There. But in terms of what its actual capability is, if you put on all the solid rocket boosters, probably a lot more because we're talking at least eight metric tons out to translunar injection orbit, so eight tons out to the moon, which means we're probably looking at some pretty good payload capabilities up to low Earth orbit. And they're also talking about a three core version similar to the Falcon Heavy that would be able to carry almost 30. Tons to low Earth orbit. So, definitely some significant capabilities working out for this rocket in the future. But what difference does that actually make? Well, first of all, if you're less expensive than Falcon 9, it means that Japanese payloads are no longer going to have to be looking for American launch providers to take them into orbit as they were in the past. SpaceX's absolute stranglehold on commercial spaceflight is starting to erode. You've got India, you've got Vulcan Centaur, and now you have the H3 competing with what Falcon 9 does, providing at the same price or perhaps even less for similar payloads or perhaps even bigger payloads. Yeah, Vulcan Centaur is more expensive than Falcon 9, but it carries much bigger payloads as well. It's more of a Falcon heavy competitor. And of course, India has a significantly lower cost. Cost for getting to low Earth orbit as well for modest size payloads. So, that being the case, we have competition coming back to commercial space flight, which is exactly what we want. But there are two other details about H3 that make it even more exciting. First of all, this rocket is capable of carrying Dream Chaser up into orbit. As a matter of fact, Sierra Space specifically made Dream Chaser. 
flexible enough to fit onto the fairing of just about any 5.4 meter fairing rocket, which includes H3, it includes Vulcan Centaur, of course, and it also includes the Ariane 6, which means in the future, if JAXA wants to buy a Dream Chaser, a human-rated Dream Chaser, which are going to start coming out by 2026-2027, Japan, in theory, could have their own human-rated space program utilizing H3 and Dream Chaser. Very exciting indeed. But it gets even more exciting because, as all of you have probably seen before, we have the Toyota Moon Cruiser. And H3 was specifically built to carry this thing to the lunar surface. And this is an extremely important part of NASA's plan to go to the moon to stay. You don't just want an unpressurized rover if you're trundling about the moon, especially for journeys of thousands of kilometers. This vehicle runs off of hydrogen fuel cells. It has solar panels for secondary power, but hydrogen fuel cells are its primary source of energy and it has a cruising range of 10,000 kilometers and that is unquestionably going to be the primary method of not only transportation but also mobile habitation across the lunar surface. This thing is big enough to accommodate four astronauts at a time and over sustained distances as opposed to unpressurized rovers where you're relying exclusively on the astronauts own built-in life support systems in their spacesuits, which are only going to last a few hours at a time. The Moon Cruiser should be ready to go by 2029, five years from now, and now we know H3 will be ready to carry it. But let's move on to the star of this video, and that is Intuitive Machines and the Odysseus. These spectacular photographs taken hours ago by the Odysseus lander have demonstrated that the probe is definitely on its way to the moon after carrying out its first commissioning burn of its primary engine. And by the way, this was a huge milestone. It is the first Methalox engine that has ever been lit out in space and it performed perfectly at least as far as we know. So at this point, now that the first burn has happened, they gather sufficient information to determine how close this burn has brought the trajectory to where it's going to hit what's called the B plane, which is the equivalent to the square on the backboard of a basketball hoop. If the basketball player hits the backboard square with a shot, the ball is likelier to go into the hoop. Similarly, if this probe hits its target Target on the B-plane after the first burn, it's in the right spot and more likely to be captured into lunar orbit. What's going to happen after this is a series of three trajectory correction maneuvers, each one smaller than the previous ones as flight controllers dial in the lander's B-plane target. TCM-3, the third burn, is the most critical maneuver because it is the last chance flight controllers are going to get to correct the trajectory before it's captured into lunar orbit. Once the final trajectory is calculated, then the controllers load in a program that will allow the lander to carry out its final orbital insertion burn on the blind side of the far side of the moon. That means that the lander is going to be taking care of this all by itself with no corrections being made and out of sight of the flight controllers. Once it emerges from the far side of the moon, at that point we will know whether or not Odysseus has carried out its maneuver correctly and is in a 100 kilometer low lunar orbit. Then after that, for each lunar orbit, Intuitive Machines expects to have about 75 minutes of communication, followed by a 45 minute loss of signal where the moon is blocking communications to the lander. And after that, they regain communications, which is called Acquisition of Signal, or AOS. Odysseus will orbit the moon approximately a dozen times before descending to the surface. <sighs> and there's still a ton of things that need to be done before Odysseus is going to be able to safely set down on the moon. You got the powered descent initiation maneuver, then the vehicle will pitch over with the main engine, then it will have to utilize hazard detection and avoidance systems to make sure it doesn't land on some sort of obstruction, then the vertical descent, 
terminal descent, and then finally, the vehicle will have landed. And I'll bring you all the details on what's involved in that process with my next update. So in the meantime, thank you very much for watching. Please like, please subscribe. Also, please consider supporting me on Patreon. It's that kind of support that allows me to travel to this FAA conference and hopefully get some interviews with SpaceX and Blue Origin representatives along with a lot of other power brokers in commercial space flight and to gain new insights into how the FAA is going to make the process of approving commercial space flight missions more efficient in the future so this entire industry can take off the way we all all hope it will. So until next time, guys, I urge all of you to stay angry about space. <laughs>